Hi. In this little mini lecture, we're going to learn how to use a program called E2 Filter Tool in Eman 2.1. This program can perform a variety of arbitrary image processing operations. Uh, for today's example, what we're going to do is look at the map that resulted from the 3D reconstruction, doesn't matter what software package, uh, and perform some interactive post-processing on the map. Uh, of course, you can do lots of other things with the software package as well, but this is a, a nice demonstration. To get things started, uh, we'll take a look at the folder that I'm in right now. Uh, I'm in a folder that contains a variety of different image files uh, in different file formats. Eman supports most of the file formats used in the CryoAM community. It doesn't matter what format it is when you run one of these programs. Uh, we're going to take a look today at a file called map.mrc, which contains a, a map of beta galactosidase. It's something like 4 or 5 angstrom resolution. Now, I could launch E2 Filter Tool directly from here, but we'll go ahead and do it via E2 Display, which is the, the file browser in Eman. So we'll say e2display.py, and that will open up a traditional sort of file browser window. We'll see a list of all the files in this folder and information about the files, including the dimensionality, if it's an image or volume data object, a number of images, if it's a stack file, uh, that sort of thing. When I highlight one of these images, it'll show a context-dependent context uh, context uh, set of uh, options that I can perform. So when I click on map.mrc, it gives me a list of different things I can do, including showing in 3D, 2D, etc. One of the options that it will show is Filter Tool. When I click on Filter Tool, it will open two new windows. Once I've got Filter Tool open, I don't actually need the browser anymore. We'll go ahead and get rid of that, just to unclutter the screen a little. One window will show a three-dimensional view of the volume file that we just loaded with a slice, slice through the middle of it. I can use my mouse wheel to, to zoom in and out a little bit on this. The other window is where we're going, to set up, we're going to set up the image processing operations that we're going to perform. So I'm going to move that off to the side a little bit, get out of the way, and maybe we'll make this window a little bit larger. Zoom in a little bit. Now if I middle click on this image button, uh, uh, sorry, on this image widget, it will give us a control panel, which allows us to adjust what we see in the view. Um, so you can see there are two objects being displayed right now. There's an isosurface and there's a slice, both referencing this data object which was opened. Uh, if I right click on either of these, like the slice, I can turn that on and off and then I can just look at the entire volume as I like. Uh, if I right click on it again, I can turn it back on. If I select the isosurface, I can get various parameters for adjusting the isosurface threshold and that sort of thing. Uh, so then if I raise that a lot, you can actually see the density map and the slice, and it's very nice. Okay. So I can adjust the isosurface threshold here to a nice level. Uh, now let's see what I want to do to this volume. So you can see this volume has been very softly masked. So let's say I want to mask it a little bit more tightly. What I'll do is I'll go over to this filter setup panel, and uh, the left button here uh, allows you to select a category of image processing operation. There are a variety of things here like filter for obviously various types of low-pass, high-pass filters, uh, mask for masking operations, uh, morphological operations, segmentation, a variety of different categories. So in this case I'm going to pick mask. And the type of mask I want to perform, now this is the subcategory view, is Auto 3D. And when I pick that, it will now give me a list of options which are available for this mask operation. Now, you'll note that there are these little checkboxes next to each of these options. Uh, there's also a checkbox next to the entire image processing operation up here. Uh, if you have the checkbox checked, then that means that it should pay attention to the value that you've set for that particular parameter. And this checkbox, when you check it, it will actually activate the filter. Until I check it, it's not actually doing any image processing at all. Uh, it starts deactivated to make sure you have a chance to adjust the parameters before you uh, actually do the filter. Because some filters will obviously produce no results until you have parameters set. So I will go ahead and set some of these parameters. If I mouse over one of the parameters and leave it still, it will give me a little bit of help about what that parameter means. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the auto mask is sort of like a flood filling operation in a paint program. Uh, it basically starts with a certain set of seed points, uh, and then it flood fills to some isosurface threshold you specify, uh, and then it uses that as a starting point and adds additional shells outside that to make, a, uh, make the mask larger than the volume and, and have a soft fall off at the edge so you don't have res resolution exaggeration or, or anything like that. So uh, there are two different ways we can seed our volume. 
Uh, one way is using radius. We can just start with a sphere in the middle of the map, which will act as a, a seed. And the other thing we can do is we can take the n highest valued points in the entire map and use those as seeds. So I'll go ahead and just set this to say, I don't know, 24. This is just an arbitrary number, so I have a variety of seeds around the map. Uh, so, so it'll take the 24 highest values in the map and use those as starting points. Uh, then I need to specify an, a threshold. This is basically an isosurface threshold which limits the flood fill. Now where do I get that number from? Well, you can see over here in the isosurface display in the control panel, I had adjusted my isosurface threshold to a value of 2.217. This will be map dependent. Uh, so I would generally say you find an isosurface threshold where the map is connected looking. You don't want to use a threshold where there's a lot of noise visible because then you might st start including some of the noise in your mask. So you pick a threshold where the noise is pretty much gone, uh, but the map is still well connected. Because if it's not connected, then the flood filling operation won't work very well. So I'd say something around 2 is probably a pretty good value in this case. So we'll put 2 in for threshold. Um, and then we have N shells and N shells gauss. N shells will expand the mask beyond that flood filled area by a certain number of one pixel wide shells. And N shells gauss will be an additional number of shells which will have a, a gaussian fall off in them. So our map size is about 240 by 240. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and say something like 10 here and 10 here. We can adjust these parameters later. You'll notice, of course, there are sliders next to each of these values. And I can grab the slider and adjust the value that way as well, which is quite convenient. Now, some of the filter operations that we might perform are very quick, very interactive. Some things take longer. This auto masking operation, since it's doing a flood fill, takes a little bit longer. So dragging the sliders in this case may not be all that interactive. But there are other things where, where it would be interactive. So uh, the, you know, the sliders exist for those cases. So I'll go ahead and check this box now. And what you should see is fairly quickly, just a second or two, uh, you'll see the new mask. So you, if you look carefully, you will notice that the edge is now softer and that it's a narrower mask than it was before. I can go ahead and turn this off and it'll return to its original state so you can see what the mask looked like. Okay, so our mask works. Uh, we've got a tighter mask than we had before. Uh, let's say we want to have it a little closer to the structure. I can maybe lower this down from 10 down to, oh, say, 5. So you can see what I mean about it not being that interactive. I can maybe even make the end shells gauss a little bit lower, make it a little bit sharper on the edge. So I, I can adjust these parameters interactively. Uh, and now I've got my new mask. Um, okay. Now, let's say I want to look at uh, the, the view in a slightly different way. This slice is nice, but it's, it's kind of blocking the 3D view, and it's a little hard to adjust any of the parameters that I contrast, that sort of thing. So I'm going to turn off the slice. And I'm going to go now up to the View menu and say Add 2D View. Okay. Now this won't get updated properly in most cases until the uh, filter is, has been toggled once. So what I'm looking through now is the bottom slice of the volume. There's nothing in it, so it's just black. If I use the arrow key, I can scroll up. I can scroll up through the layers until I get into the volume. And so now I'm somewhere just a little bit above the central slice. Now you can see it's very contrasty, hard to see. So again, I'm going to middle click on this view, and that'll open up a control panel for that view. And I can say Auto Contrast, and that'll get the contrast down to a reasonable level. Now I can much more easily see the mask. Uh, and if I, let's see, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Zoom in. Uh, if I turn the mask off again, uh, now you can see very clearly uh, where the mask is outside the structure. All right. Well, We've done we've done a nice masking operation, but let's say we also want to do some some sharpening or maybe even maybe a low pass filter. Let's say we want to blur it out a little bit so we can make a smoother mask for some particular purpose. So what I'll do now is I'll go over here and I'll hit this button. So these four buttons here are used to control a sequence of different image processing operations that you can perform. If I press plus, it will create a new empty image processing operation after the mask. Uh, if I want to move it before the mask, I just press this little up arrow, and now it'll happen before the mask instead of after. 
so let's do a filter low pass Gauss. So this will give us a nice low pass Gaussian filter which will smooth the map out. Now with the filters, uh, you can specify the filter in several different ways. You can specify it in absolute terms and it, as a fraction of, uh, of Nyquist, well a fraction of Nyquist where 0.5 is, is at Nyquist. It's more convenient for the math that way. So if I entered 0.5 in here then the, the filter wouldn't happen until Nyquist and it wouldn't really do much of anything. Uh, although that's a half width so it would, it would have a little bit of a filtering effect. Uh, I could also spe specify the cutoff in terms of uh, spatial frequency, which is convenient that I can put it in angstroms, or 1 over angstroms. Uh, I can specify it in terms of pixels in Fourier space. Uh, I can specify it in terms of a resolvability instead of, uh, instead of a, a cutoff frequency. It's a slightly different, uh, slightly different term. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uncheck this, and I'll specify frequency, and I'll low-pass filter this to, say, uh, 8 angstroms, which would be 0.125. That's 1 divided by 8. So it's a frequency rather than a, a, a resolution. Uh, and then I'll turn this filter on. Note I have the mask turned off now. And we'll see, ah, look, the map got blurrier. I can see that in both views. Uh, and if I grab this slider, I can interactively adjust the amount of filtration on the map. Now you'll note each time it changes the filter, that impacts the isosurface value. And it'll, it'll take a second, but it'll automatically adjust the, adjust the isosurface value to match what I had before pretty well as well. So we'll say 0.125 here again, nice low-pass filter. Uh, I could turn on the auto mask again. In this case, it's not going to have uh, a whole lot of effect uh, on the mask because the mask is happening first. If I swap the order of these things and I low-pass filter first and then I mask, uh, we'll find that, the, uh, that, that, that there, is, there is a somewhat different impact generally. In this case, it didn't do a whole lot. I guess the isosurface threshold, sorry, the isosurface threshold I used here is still somewhat valid. Let's see, isosurface, you can see it's 0.874 now. So if it's using an isosurface threshold of 2, uh, that's, that's a, a, a bit higher in this. It's a, getting a little disconnected, but with the extra shells that we're adding, it's still okay. Uh, but I, if I had this map, this filtered map, I would probably want to set an isosurface threshold somewhere more like 1. So I can come down here, I can adjust that to 1. Um, Oops, I have 12 now. <laughs> you can see that's a tight mask. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so now we have a nice, uh, a nice sequence of image processing operations. Okay, now let's say I have figured out the ni a nice set of parameters for filtering and masking my map, and I want to reproduce that process now on a whole bunch of different output maps I've generated. I've done five or six different refinements, and I want to filter them and mask them all in the same way so I can compare them to each other. Uh, this program only lets you operate on one image or one stack of 2D, vo uh, 2D images uh, at a time easily, but it gives you the parameters you need if you, in case you want to do it in a uh, more uh, reproducible way. Um, so what we'll go ahead and do is we'll just quit the program now. So I'm just gonna, going to close my control panel window here, shut everything else down, and if I look in the folder now, you'll see there's a new file called filtertooldefault.txt. If I look at that file, it contains two dash dash process options, and it actually explains up here what, what the file contains. One of them here is for the filter.lowpass.gauss, the other one is for the mask.auto3d, uh, with the parameters in, in eman 2 standard form. So what I could do now is if I want to perform that, apply that image processing to, to a map, I can just say e2proc3d.py uh, input map, oops, map.mrc uh, out.hdf, uh, I can use whatever file format I like, uh, and then I would just uh, copy and paste uh, these image processing operations. And I think my copy and paste is messed up somehow here. Uh, it's okay, this is something funny going on on my Mac, nothing to do with Eman. Uh, so I can just paste those operations in there, uh, and uh, in sequence, and it will do exactly what it did in the other application. Uh, now there's one little caveat here, there's one bug that's present in Filter Tool, which is on the command line, I'm not allowed to use things like true and false. You can see here it says return mask equals false. 
uh, I have to say zero or one instead of true or false here. That's a little bug that I've been meaning to fix for a while but haven't gotten around to. But anyway, once we've once we've done that, it will then perform the image processing operation, and now we have out.hdf. You can say e2 display out.hdf. And lo and behold, we have our filtered and masked volume. Okay, uh, that's about it. I'm not going to take you through all of the different operations that are uh, available within E2 Filter Tool. If you want to get a list of all of the available image processing operations, there's a command called e2help.py. Uh, you can say e2help.py by itself. It'll tell you the types of operations you can look at. Then you can say processors, which are what Filter Tool uses. And it will give you a list of all of the different available processors and the parameters that they take. If I do that again and I add a dash V2, or V1 would work too, it will then give me a verbose list of all of the processors. If I'm looking specifically for a sub uh, category of processors, I could say e2help.py processors, uh, say mask, and then it will just give me a list of all of the mask operations, which will help uh, reuse things. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Unix, uh, that works just like the grep, uh, grep on the command line, basically. So I could say uh, anything that's, that's part of the name. So I could say, for example, noise, and it will return anything that has noise in its name. All right. Uh, I hope you enjoy that little demo. Uh, feel free, of course, to email me if you have any questions about this. Thanks for watching.